yes, we've had these technical difficulties and uh, we have a little bit pushed for time. I, I won't read the passage. I trust that you uh, have all uh, read through it or have it in front of you. Now, we've been on a series on how to be equipped for service, or that's our theme for the year, and we've tied in Paul's uh, teaching or letter to the Ephesians to, to try and understand uh, what it takes for us to be equipped in the different aspects of our lives. We have been, over the last few weeks, looking at the dynamics of different relationships, mainly husbands and wives, parents and children, slaves and masters. Now, today, the focus is on ourselves. We look at how to build ourselves up and keep ourselves safe. Because Paul begins by warning us that we're in a battle with spiritual forces. One of the most dangerous aspects for an army would be if the army is complacent and they feel there is no threat. So Paul sounds the warning gong, as it were, to say, we are in a battle. And just because you can't see a physical enemy, it doesn't mean you're not under assault. And so therefore, he says, we, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is a spiritual battle we are in. Now, let me say that there needs to be a balance when we think about this spiritual warfare. There are groups and strands of theology that I feel go to the extreme where everything is a spiritual battle to the point where people stop taking responsibility for their poor choices and, and actions. And I don't think we should be on either extreme where on one side we just deny uh, the spiritual realm and feel that everything is physical and everything is cause and effect. Uh, I do believe, and if you read the Gospels, not just the Gospels, but right through the scripture, the spiritual realm is very much a, a part of daily living. In the Old Testament, we have the patriarchs meeting and speaking with angels uh, and have seen supernatural events uh, in their lives. In the New Testament, Jesus uh, actively cast out demons and, and addressed this spiritual battle. Uh, he himself uh, encountered uh, the devil uh, for three days and in, in, in nights in the wilderness. So we know that this is real and we need to maintain a balance in our lives. So when we come to the armor of God, Paul is telling us in the same analogy, you are in a battle and there is no soldier anywhere that goes into battle without equipment because that would be suicide otherwise, right? So we are encouraged to take uh, certain armor and, and weapons into the battle. So I would like to uh, touch quickly on these elements, but they serve as a checklist to us in our lives, in, in our Christian lives, do we have a balance of these elements and, and how do we hold this all together? So let's start looking um, at what the soldier wears, what he puts on his body. So we had a very amusing variations of the helmet uh, and, and the breastplate and the belt and shoes or, or sandals in those days, more likely. Um, so let's start off by looking at the helmet of salvation. And figuratively, the helmet is what guards the head. And we could use it to understand that this is Paul's encouragement to guard our minds and how we think. And that we should center our thoughts on the fact that we are saved through the grace of God, given through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. 
So we need this helmet to guard against any suggestion that our salvation might be through works or through loyalty to a particular church or theology or to a, a charismatic or dynamic person. Salvation is the free gift of God through grace. And we only need to acknowledge and receive it. Of course, it comes with a repentance of our sin and an acknowledgement that we can't do anything to save ourselves. So let's keep that in mind, so to speak, uh, because there, there's always the, the inclination or the temptation of people out there to, to make us feel obliged to do certain things I, I feel the joy of my Christian life is not one of obligation. I, I don't feel tied down. I'm happy to do these things because of a warm, loving relationship. And it's based on this gift of grace, of salvation that comes through Christ. The second is the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, this guards our heart. Why, why do soldiers wear the breastplate? Well, Primarily, the heart and the lungs are the vital organs, right? If your heart is pierced or your lungs, uh, then you're, you're pretty much done for. Um, so there's this breastplate of righteousness. And I, and I like the, the physical uh, picture that Paul is trying to communicate. Because it's like a soldier, uh, one of the things that marks a soldier is, is their carriage and, and you see the guards whether it's all like the palace in England or, or any such place or the marines in Washington uh, the Gurkhas in Nepal they all stand straight and they have their chest out but they have a breastplate that, that guards their heart and Paul likens this breastplate to righteousness and I think there's an encouragement there for us to live or aspire to live lives of righteousness. That this is our guard against the wiles of the devil. You know, Greg some time ago shared about how uh, when he was single, uh, a lady tempted him. And, and when he looks back on it, he's so grateful that he didn't succumb to that temptation. Well, knowing Greg and looking at his life, he's attempted to live his life with that rest plate of righteousness and it's guarded his heart and prevented him from falling into sin and I think I want to encourage us that that is such an important goal especially to the young teenagers who are listening to this message to the younger ones start off early by trying to do what is right by right? trying to lead or live a righteous life not so that you might claim that you are self-righteous but by trying to live a righteous life, we guard our hearts from the temptations of the world and the things that can bring us to town. The third one, and I'm skipping the belt of truth, and you'll see why in a minute, but the third one I like to raise are the sandals of peace. Uh, and this picture of a soldier always having his sandals on is very appropriate. Uh, when, when I was in the Navy and we were on exercise or on full alert, we would actually sleep uh, not just with our shoes on, but we, we would have our uniforms on and our battle gear, but certainly we would keep our boots on because our boots, as you know, were just so many laces to keep it on. And you had no time to scramble if, if you had to put on your boots and tie your laces. So we just slept with our boots on so that the moment that there was a call, we could respond. And I think this is the urgency that Paul is trying to communicate, that a, a soldier is always aware of the work of the kingdom, that we're always alert to the opportunity to, to reach out to someone, to share our faith. And I'm not talking about walking around with a pile of pamphlets in your pocket and just giving it out to everybody. I think it's the attitude of being alert to opportunities that the spirit may bring our way. There may be someone that we can just show an act of kindness 
we may not have to explain it right in that moment, but by extending that gesture of kindness or hospitality uh, or grace, the spirit can make use of that to, to speak to that person's heart. We have to leave that to God, but it, it is our responsibility uh, and our choice to be always alert to what God may be doing around us. The fourth one is the belt of truth. And I've left it for the last item on the soldier's body. Because if you've ever worn uh, what we call a standard battle order, which again, we had to use during our military training, the thing that hooks everything together is the belt. Because the battle order comes over your shoulders, you, you have your, your breastplate as it were, and you have all the other things that, that hang from you. But it's the belt that holds it all together. Now, let me point out that in scripture, truth is not an accuracy or aggregate of facts. I'll say again, truth is not the accuracy nor an aggregate of facts. Truth in scripture is a person. And we know that Jesus himself said, I am the truth. I am the truth. Truth, therefore, is a person. And we understand everything. Christ, who is that belt of truth, holds everything together. When we try to understand the link between the Old and the New Testaments, when we try to understand the purposes of God, why salvation has to come through a person, it is the person of Christ, the truth, who links everything together. As has been said, history is his story. Everything that from the Old Testament that leads down to Christ and thereafter that expands away from Christ, everything is held together by the one who is the truth, the way and the life. And so it is by having this relationship with him that we hold everything together. Now the two weapons, the shield of faith. We live in a world that will always test and question us. It is a world filled with cynicism. Again, I address those of you who are teenagers and social media, many of your friends around you will be cynical about why you should put your faith in God. Well, I always used to respond to my friends by saying, I can't explain it, but I know that God is real and that he is in my heart and I can feel that. And I want to live in a relationship with him. And I wish to place my life in his hands and, and to live with the faith in a loving God, a God who loves me, who died for me, who cares for me. And as many of you know, I'm, I'm now well into my senior citizen years. I'm, I'm 64 this year. And I think that is singularly the best decision I ever made. I always say the second best one was the Mary Lynn, but the best decision I ever made was to put my faith and my trust in Jesus and, and in God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And, and I've lived through the decades and, and I've journeyed with many people uh, and I am more convinced today than when I made my decision at 14, uh, 50 years ago, I'm more convinced today of the efficacy, the reality, the practicality of putting our faith in Christ. So this is the shield that whatever the world throws at me, I choose to place my trust and my faith in a loving and living God. Finally, the sword of truth. 
which is the word. And I believe this is actually the most effective counter. The sword not only attacks, but it defends as well. Uh, and we need to ground ourselves in the word. And that is why as the preaching team, as the leaders in BCF, we've chosen to work hard on our sermon series and to, to try and give you a broad spectrum of teaching so that we can equip you, so that we can build you up, so that we can give you the right equipment and weapons uh, to, to journey through life, to, to wage the battles that you have to face, but both in flesh and blood, as well as against the principalities and powers. So I would encourage you afresh to commit yourselves to reading and understanding the word of God. And I'm not just talking about memorizing scripture. I'm talking about getting into the word, having the desire to get into the word at a level where you understand the heart of God and the spirit of the law, not just the letter of the law, but to really have a relationship for the one who is the law. And when, when you have that, you understand that the law is not there to bind us. The law is there to set us free. The law guides us so that we don't have to incur penalty uh, when the day of judgment comes. And when we really embrace this sword, it, it protects us against the cunning and the wiles of the world. Uh, now we battle with this thing called fake news and, and nobody knows or seems to have a bearing on, on what is real or what is fake, what is true and what is false. But for me, I find that coming back to the word of God and, and the heart of God that is in his word helps me discern what is more likely to be true than not. Let me just put it that way, okay? Uh, we, it's something that we constantly have to uh, ask for discernment, we have to think through, we have to wrestle with, and we have our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's why we have um, leaders or elders in the church, and even amongst the elders, we have one another to bounce things off and, and, and to check one another so that we can hold fast to what is true. So let me encourage you uh, to stay with us and on your own to, to have this hunger and desire to get into the word of God, to know the author. It is one thing to know the word, it's, a, it's another thing to know the author. And I think it, it is by knowing the author that, that, that we appreciate the written word more, uh, that we see the beauty, the wisdom, and the love that is uh, encapsulated in his word because he is a loving God. Now, let me then close by saying, Paul rounds off the book of Ephesians by encouraging them to pray on all occasions. We have talked about the equipment and the weapons of a soldier, but a soldier without communications with his command is really quite lost and up for grabs because he's running off somewhere doing what he thinks uh, may be important uh, without an awareness of what is happening on the whole battlefield. I'm sure you understand that analogy. Um, it's like a school teacher running her class without any communication with, with the headmaster or, or with the administration and, and not being part of a syllabus and just doing what he or she thinks is right. Well, to some extent that may work, but what happens when your students go on to the next level? Uh, you, you're not in keeping with with the whole flow of things. So prayer is our communication with the command center, as it were. It is what makes us aware of what the spirit is doing. One of my constant prayers is, in any difficult situation, is to pause and to say, Lord, what are you doing? What are you wanting? What are you expecting in this situation? Are you wanting patience? 
Are you wanting forbearance? Are you wanting forgiveness? Or do you require action? So these are questions that, that are part of this whole attitude of prayer that we live with. And when Paul talks about praying on all occasions, he, he's not talking about us always getting down on our knees, bowing our heads and closing our eyes. I think it is a lifestyle. Uh, I would like to believe that prayer is, is as much a part of my breathing, that in everything I do, uh, it, it is a part of that attitude and commitment of prayer. And you can start that off by just simply um, offering your activities to the Lord, whether you're going for a walk or, or going to play a game or going on the basketball court, you can thank God for your health and just pray for your uh, teammates and for your opponents and say, Lord, keep us safe and help us play well to the best of our abilities and to enjoy the game. Uh, I don't think there's any activity that, that we can't uh, express appreciation and, and, and make a commitment uh, to the Lord to to do it uh, for his glory and, and also for his enjoyment. I, I think when we engage in the activities of life, God delights in, in watching us cook, in, in walk, watching us wash dishes or, or planting grass, whatever it may be. So I would like to round off this message by saying in, in the military analogy, uh, we were always taught in, in, to constantly have what we call a status check. To, to, to look at our uniform and our equipment, is, is my rifle in place? Do I have the rounds that I need? Are my rounds wet? Is, is my rifle rusty? Uh, will, will it fire when I need to fire it? Will it hit the target when I aim it? Is my weapon zeroed? For those of you who understand the term. So this summary of Paul is, is a call to a status check. And I would like to encourage you in this coming week to, to think of these aspects of our lives uh, uh, using the analogy in Ephesians chapter 6 and to just have an update on, on where we are uh, in, in our readiness to, to participate in, in the kingdom of God uh, and in our communications with the command center. So we hope that you have enjoyed the series uh, and that you would put the, these uh, ideas and, and uh, motivations into practice in, in your life. Uh, husbands, love your wives. As Christ loves the church, uh, parents, obey your children. I'm sorry, children obey your parents. That must be a Freudian slip. Uh, <laughs> children obey your parents. Parents don't exasperate your children. Uh, and we just need to always maintain that balance in our lives. So thank you for joining us uh, for this time of worship. I'll close us in prayer. Uh, on the family Sunday, because of all the activities, we, we do not have the prayer time together. But we want to acknowledge you to... Uh, post your prayer items, uh, particularly if you have pressing or urgent ones, and you can be assured that those of us who read it will, will support you in prayer. Uh, so once again, thank you to everyone uh, for your participation this morning, and let me close our time in prayer now. Great God, we thank you that you are also a loving God. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the belt of truth that holds all things together. And we pray that you would anoint us with this full armor, the helmet that guards our minds and the knowledge that we are saved through grace, the breastplate of righteousness. Help us to walk in your paths of righteousness so that our hearts may be guarded from the wiles of the devil and the sandals of peace that we're always ready to, to bring your message of good news of love and we know that you the one who is truth holds this all together 
equip us with the knowledge of your word, the truth that is the sword of truth. And also, we know that you go before us, our, our shield of faith. We, we place our faith and our trust in you, Lord. We know that uh, you who are in us is greater than he who is in the world. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against your kingdom. And you have given us the victory in Christ. And for this, the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon all of us this Sunday and always. Amen. So thank you, everyone. Uh, Holtz, uh, enjoy your uh, lunch.